Hello. So welcome to my talk. Um, I'm Paula Carnell. And for those of you who are catching this on the replay, I'm sharing my story of how I went from an artist to a bee speaker. So today's talk is all about my extraordinary story and how my life changed and how I went from being an artist and then through seven years of being bed and wheelchair bound and how I then ended up um, coming to be a bee lady, a bee expert, um, a bee speaker. So what I do is I now work all around the world and I work with honey producers, I work with beekeepers and I run workshops and talks um, to educate people about the importance of bees. So bees came into my life in a really unusual way and I'm often asked about my story and how I how I got interested in bees and how they came into me. So um, what I'm going to do is share share my story. So we're now live. I've got some people coming in, so that's great. And what I'm going to be doing is um, waiting a few minutes for a few more people to come in, and then we can actually get going. So um, if you're on Facebook, then you may need to give permission to actually let people, um, let me see who you are, because when you comment, I'm not actually going to be able to see. So here we go. Brilliant. The number's going up. Wonderful. So if you're joining now, if you could just type in the comments and let me know who you are and where you're coming in from, because I know I've got people all around the world. So I'd love to see where you're coming in. So let's have a look. Who have we got here? Oh, hi, Sam. Thank you for coming. Hello. Hello. Wonderful. So I'm going to give, I'm just going to wait for a few more people to come on and then um, I will make a start. So what I'd like you to do as well is type your questions throughout the, um, the talk and then I will answer them at the end. OK, so that's the plan. Right. I think we've got quite a nice group here. There's people coming in. Hello. Hello. <gasps> Wonderful. It's all working so far. I can see who, who everybody is. Brilliant. We've got somebody here from Chicago. I know, Lindsay, you're over in Vancouver. So wonderful. Some Somerset people. So great. We're a real global community. So everyone coming together. The bees bring us all together. Oh, hi, Frank. I'm so pleased you're here. So another, another Chicago person. So that's great. So you're going to learn a bit more about my history. And although you've read the book, Frank, I know you're a great, great follower of the book. So you already know some of the story. So here we go then. I'm going to be um, doing some screen sharing. So I'm going to do a slide presentation. It's a bit different to what I would have done if I was on the stage, because obviously I'm not on a stage and I can't see if you're falling asleep or if you're clapping or anything like that. So chatting through on the comments is great. Um, I won't always be able to read them, but at least, um, you, you know, I can see them popping up and that really is encouraging. So I'm here in Somerset in the UK. And um, as I mentioned earlier on, I was an artist for over 20 years and I exhibited all around the world. And um, through quite a serious illness, I spent seven years bed and wheelchair bound. And that was when the bees came into my life. So um, it was a really a big transformation. So this whole period of lockdown has had quite um, an impact on me because it reminds me a lot of when I was isolated through illness and I lost my business as an artist. I lost my business, um, you know, being able the freedom and being able to come and go. So it's really interesting how this transformation, although it was for me and it was quite solitary while I was ill, I can now see the whole world going through this similar transformation. So it's quite an exciting time. And I'm hoping that by sharing my story, it will inspire you to um, think a bit more about, well, not only your work with bees, for those of you who do work with bees, but also for people who are interested in nature and want to understand the connection of it and how health and bees and nature, how it's all connected and just how much I learned through all of this. 
So I'm going to start my presentation and then you will all get to learn a bit more. So I'm Paula Carnell. I'm creating a buzz about health. And here we go. Oh. Right. OK, let me try again. <laughs> Right, so it's really good to see so many of you here and from all around the world. So we can be a bit of a global village here, all talking about bees. And I'm really touched because here we've had horrendous storms. So I'm very pleased that um, some of you have, have taken the time when there's been a chance that you could be outside enjoying this weather, that you're actually inside and, and watching me. So... Here we go. So if you're on Facebook, it would be really great if you can share um, this talk. So you need to go to your Facebook page and you'll see the like, comment and share. And from there, you can share that. Um, you'll get a link and you can then share this event and you can share my talk. And it would be really great to share it amongst other bee people or people that need a bit of inspiration or want to have something cheerful to watch for a time. So I'd be really grateful for that because I've got a big message that I want to share around the world. And it's just really important that I can inspire as many people as possible. That's my, my life purpose. So my book is A to B's. And what I'm gonna be doing is in doing a bit of um, pre-introduction before the book started. And during this webinar and afterwards, you will be able to download an ebook version of this book. And this is this gives you an idea of the book. So there's 50 little chapters in there and it's all about my journey, A to Bs. You'll learn a lot about bees. You'll learn a lot about Oman. You'll learn a bit about health. You'll learn about different things to do with bees and nutrition and, and how I've come to, to be where I am now. So add your questions, insights or comments as we go, and then I'll go through at the end and I'll answer any questions. So I was born in Weymouth in Dorset, which is a seaside town. And I've moved about 30 years, um, 30 miles in my whole life. So I've not come that far. So I'm really a Dorset girl, but I feel I've emigrated because I now live in Somerset. So here I am on a busy street in, in Weymouth in a pram and always smiling. So I haven't changed too much there. And here I am at about three years old. And I love this picture because I've got a pretend camera. Now, those of you who follow me on Instagram, you'll see that I'm always taking pictures and I love taking pictures. And whenever I travel anywhere, I take hundreds, I mean, even thousands of pictures. My trip to Bhutan, I had about two and a half thousand photographs from three weeks. And so I've always loved capturing moments. And I suppose that comes from being an artist. And when I, even when I was a child, I would draw. But at this stage, perhaps before I could capture what I really wanted, I would just take pictures. So I didn't have a real camera, but I had a pretend camera. So I was starting, starting that way. And here I am, age 16, after my O-level exams, and I had my first solo exhibition in Yeovil in Somerset. So again, only about 10 miles from here. And this exhibition was work that I had done during my school years. I used to just draw all the time. And I was really passionate about earning a living as an artist. I knew that this was really, really important to me. So many people say, oh, you can't earn a living as an artist. And I was just determined to prove everybody wrong. So I did. And I had this exhibition and I sold out and it was just a fabulous, fabulous start to my career. And it came just after I'd had a really bad ending to my my schooling. So I wasn't very academic and I'd actually done really badly in my exam. So I was put into an art school after my head teacher had done a bit of a deal with the art school. So it was all based on my portfolio and the, the quality of the work I had. So I'd got into art school, but it wasn't the start I wanted. I hadn't got into the colleges I wanted, which could have led me on a different path. So in some ways, I'd always picked the tough path. So there we go. I, I had these paintings and I know that there, there's some people who are joining me today who've got some of those early paintings. And for that, I'm really grateful. 
And so I carried on and I went through art school and then I traveled to America and then I came back and in 1990, I set up a business called Posse. And this was my paintings and I had some help from the Prince's Youth Business Trust and Livewire and the local enterprise agency. And I set up my business and the goal was to just sell my paintings. But I found that selling paintings, not everyone could afford the time or the effort or the size of the paintings that I was doing. And so I started printing greeting cards of my work. I'd also met and married um, the father of my children. And so together we then ran this business. He'd given up his job after a couple of years and, and helped me. And in 95, we bought a premises in Castle Carey, the town I still live in. And um, you can still see the premises. It's up by the post office and the roundhouse, which is a little round jail in the town. And I had it as a gallery and a shop. So through those blue doors, the big blue gates there was a long courtyard and there was a long gallery there and I was so lucky I got to exhibit some incredible artists and the idea was that it was it was solo exhibition so I was promoting the best of an artist and I really wanted the artists to actually be able to to earn a good living as well. So this wasn't about um, doing something on the side or having a proper job and selling a few paintings this was serious so it really grew, it really developed. I had nine years in Castle Carey, um, but the last two years I was on my own because um, the father of my children, when they were one and three, met a shepherdess and, and fled. So I then had to find a new way of, of managing everything on myself, or on my own. And I had two boys, so I had to try and think about what was important to me in life. And these are some of my paintings. Um, after having my first son, I just went down this whole new track of painting big flowers. I was just so excited about flowers. And we had a long courtyard there, so I would grow plants that I would paint. And so my paintings were these large flower paintings and on silk. And I was really inspired by Georgia O'Keeffe, an American artist. And so some of my work was was perhaps inspired and influenced by her. And I was lucky that through my art, I actually got to travel to New Mexico and I actually got to see Abiquiu and Ghost Ranch and see some of her original paintings. So my work as an artist took me all around the world in Switzerland, America, I'd be exhibiting. So I loved it. I absolutely loved what I was doing. So who here is an artist? I'm just interested to know how many of you have actually come onto this as an artist. So just type in. And it's something that's very interesting career. And in a lot of ways, it's similar to being a beekeeper. They're both things that are meant to be a hobby. And yet you have people there who do earn living and actually have fabulous life from doing their passion. And when I was an artist, I always wanted to um, inspire other people because I was so grateful to be able to do what I loved. I wanted to inspire other people to do what they loved. And I felt I wasn't going to inspire anybody if I was starving in a garret. So that classic image of an artist who, who never had anything, I didn't want to be like that. I wanted to be able to say to people, look, if you do this, you can then give up your horrible job and you can live life to the full. And I really fully believe that if we're all doing what we're passionate about, we can make the world a better place. So somebody here has asked um, where the name Posse came from for my business. Well, when I was um, just starting up my business, I remember listening to a Radio 4. See, I've always been a bit older than, than perhaps I look. And um, I was listening to this Radio 4 programme, which was talking about business names. And they said that the most successful business names began with a consonant and had two syllables because people would remember it. Now, when I was at school, my nickname was Poe. Um, because I didn't like polos and Paula wasn't really a name anyone could shorten. So it's one of those things where you're all sat around trying to think, what nickname can you have? So I did get called Polo and Poe for a long time. And so Poe and Paula's silk paintings and then Posse came about. And it was just before the Radio 2 DJ, the UK DJ, Steve Wright, um, had his posse. So for somehow, I always seem to miss out on that great connection, which would have been been fabulous. So the flowers were always an inspiration to me. I love to grow the flowers and I liked the fact that the flowers were 
um, you know, I'd be holding them in my hand and then those, um, the energy of the flower would come out in the painting. And by painting on silk, you get a great light coming back from them. So here I am with my boys and this is after I'd sold the gallery and I just, I took a year out to be a proper mum and to do up a, a home that we're still living in now. And then I had a, I met my current husband, Greg, and we got married. And then I had this exhibition in London in 2008. And it was a fabulous success. Um, I was sharing it with two other artists and we were in Cork Street in London. And I just loved it. But I'd been having periods of feeling very poorly and I'd be really tired. And it's very interesting, the connection with Georgia O'Keeffe, because when I read her autobiographies and her letters, she would often collapse after an exhibition and she would have weeks in bed where she couldn't move. And quite often she even missed her private views because she was so um, she was just so exhausted. And so I thought, well, maybe that's it. I'm just an emotional artist and the, the energy that goes into putting on um, an exhibition um, was just too much for me. So I had this exhibition in London and the highlight for me was this painting here. Now I'd been growing canners for years, years and years. And my garden was full of one to three exotic plants that I had nurtured and then I would paint. And the studio that I'm talking to you from now, which is a wooden shed in my garden, um, outside were all these bright orange canners. And so every time I would come and go to my studio for about two or three months of the year, there'd be these canners in bloom, which I just adored, but I hadn't figured out how to paint them. And they'd get the raindrops on them. And I just, I just adored them. So this painting was actually in my head for about six or seven years. And then for the exhibition in London, on the last sort of six months for the exhibition, I produced this painting and I loved it. And I knew it was the best painting I'd ever done. The, the vibrancy of the colors, the energy of it, I loved the actual painting of it. So when it was hung in the gallery, it literally glowed. And so many people were drawn to it and just going, wow, that's just such a magical painting. And so I put a magical price on it because I just thought I need to be inspirational. I'm exhibiting in London. This has really got to be worth it. And I always said to artists, I used to coach artists when I had the gallery. And I used to say, when you sell a painting, people always say, how much do you charge for a painting? How do you know what to charge for it? And the thing is, when you sell a painting, it's actually got to make you feel that you're grateful to have sold it. It's no good if you've sold it and you still haven't you still can't eat or you can't do anything. So when I would run an exhibition, either for an artist or for someone else, I would, or for my own work, I would say, right, what do you want to achieve at the end of this exhibition? And obviously you want to pay your framing bill. And if you can have a break or a holiday, and because I was feeling tired, I would often think, well, after this exhibition, I want to be able to have a few weeks off. And quite often it would be two years of work to produce work for an exhibition. So you may look at artists' work and think, gosh, that's a lot of money. But if they're not earning any money for two years, and then if they only get two years' income from selling all the paintings, it's, you know, it's very hard then to make a real difference in your own life, let alone in other people's. So this painting was put up for a five-figure sum, and I actually sold it for a five-figure sum. And what was even more extraordinary was the guy that bought it he bought another three paintings that were four figure sums. So I was just top of my game. And from this exhibition, I then got invited to exhibit at Art in Action, which was gonna be July in um, 2009. So I had just under a year to prepare for that. But as 2008 went on, I was building up to my 40th birthday. I was two years into my, my marriage and I really wanted another child. And um, I'd always wanted a, a little girl, a daughter. And I had two sons and I was just really hopeful. And so when I'd feel ill and tired, I'd think, oh, well, perhaps I'm, I'm pregnant. Perhaps I'm going to have another baby. And so I'd have a couple of, of weeks where in between school runs, I would just be in bed. And then I would go and have tests at the doctors. And then they would just say, um, I'm sorry, you know, we can't find anything wrong with you. And no, you're not pregnant. And this went on. And then these periods of illness got closer and closer together. And I would be um, 
getting to the stage where it would be for a longer period of time. So instead of a week, it would then be two weeks or then it would be three weeks. And for my 40th birthday, I actually was at a, in a position where I could only drink champagne, which was quite funny, but that really was the only alcohol that I could cope with. And, um, and I knew that something wasn't right. And then as the, the year went on, just after my 40th, I just started to get more and more sick and and things just weren't right. And I was feeling like my whole body was electric. It was just buzzing. Um, interesting that it was um, buzzing. <laughs> and so I then found that each day was getting harder and harder and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then one day I found that I was like this. I couldn't move. I couldn't lift my arms. I couldn't cope with any sound. I couldn't be touched. And I had to be in a dark room. So I wore these eye masks. I had earplugs and I just would lay in bed. And this was I was in this state for seven years. And through that seven years, I would build up so that I could have a few hours a day where I could do something else. So a lot of this time was spent meditating, really, because that was all I could do. And I've always tried to be positive and I'd always try and think, well, this is happening for a reason. But there was a huge amount of grief, um, tremendous grief, because I really wanted to carry on painting and I wanted to exhibit and I wanted to change the world. I wanted to have my paintings in Hawaii. I wanted more and more of these big paintings that I love doing and to get them into big galleries. I would love to have been exhibiting at the amazing gallery in Chicago that I spent so much time in last year when I visited um, and spoke to Frank's group. So this is the point that my book starts and where I had to make the most awful phone call. And they say that when you can tell your story and no longer cry, that you're healed. But just this bit often does still give me a bit of a wobble. And I've never liked to let people down or give up on anything. And I had to phone up um, the organisers for Art in Action, which was going to be the transformational exhibition of my career, because that's where the museums and art galleries go to, to look at artists that they're going to um, buy work from to put in international collections and, and national collections and although I had lots of private collectors of my work I didn't I didn't have any paintings in big national galleries and so for the whole 20 years of my art career I'd really wanted to be at Art in Action and finally I'd had the invitation and then this illness meant I had to phone up and cancel and just say I can't do it and I it was just devastating it was heartbreaking I was crying the whole time on the phone. The poor woman on the other side was crying too. Um, and I just was convinced that she was thinking I was just being lazy or I was just, I'd had a better offer. And so it really was heartbreaking. And that was probably the toughest turning point for me. But at the same time, by letting that go, I then had to start thinking about who am I and what am I and where am I going next? So what I had to do was think not what I can't do or what will I do if I ever get better, because I still didn't know what was wrong with me. Um, so I would think, well, what can I do now? And I think that is one of the most important lessons for us all is what can we do now? Not when things are better, when you have more money, when you've got the ideal family. None of this It's what can you do now? And I knew that I'd always wanted to keep bees. And I had no idea why. I just had this feeling that I should keep bees. And I knew that if I lay in bed, I could look out the window. And if there was a hive in our garden, because my, my bedroom's on the ground floor, I could watch bees. And so that's what I wanted. So I nagged and nagged. And my